Keep it up. Slow no, it down for you over there. Keep it up. Keep it up. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Uh, welcome, everyone, to the September 7th, 2016 meeting of the Scarborough Town Council. I'll call the meeting to order, and uh, if everyone would rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, please. Councilor Bayvine? Present. Councilor Rowland? Here. Councilor Caterina? Here. Councilor St. Clair? Here. Councilor Hayes? Here. Councilor Chiazzo? Here. Chairman Donovan? Here. Uh, general public comments. Uh, anyone wishing to address the council on any matter uh, other than those that are on the agenda uh, for later this evening, please approach the podium. Close uh, General public comments. Minutes of August 17, 2016, regular meeting. No, accept the motion. Move approval. Second. Second. Comments or corrections? All in favor? Opposed? Unanimous. Uh, adjustments to the agenda. I guess none at this time. Uh, items to be signed are the treasurer's warrants, and I will do that later in the meeting. Uh, Order number 16-50, 7 p.m. public hearing and second reading on the proposed amendment to Chapter 405, the Zoning Ordinance, Section Roman Numeral <coughs> 17B, Hagus Parkway District. Uh, in way of uh, introduction, I'll ask the Planning Director to approach the podium and address this. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, uh, uh, Chairman Donovan. Thank you, Town Councilors. Um, it's nice to be here. I apologize for missing your last meeting earlier in the summer. You're feeling better. I'm up right now, so I can address <laughs> you appropriately. Later. Um, so, you know, I know that you consider this at first reading, so you have the background on it. Um, this is really another <coughs> zoning district which already allows for multifamily housing, where um, the proposal is actually to to a adjust or amend how the town kind of regulates the size of multifamily housing. Um, we've been making changes in our other zones to instead of regulate um, multifamily housing by the number of units per building, um, to instead look at building footprint and building height as a better metric to ensure that these buildings kind of fit into the various neighborhoods or districts where they're allowed. So in this case, the Haggis Parkway District, which currently is um, both a commercial zone and a zone that allows for some residential and multifamily housing, allows multifamily housing up to 12 units per building. And rather than sticking with that metric, is proposed to change to each building can be up to 12,500 square feet of building footprint, so the size of the building, and be limited to three stories or 45 feet in height. Um, and this was generated really because the Haggis Parkway District is a more open area. It's not in a, a dense area like, say, Oak Hill or some neighborhoods where we've been allowing smaller multifamily buildings. Um, so a bit larger multifamily is proposed to be allowed, while also still being kind of in scale with Scarborough. You know, um, 12,500 square feet footprint really kind of is right about the industry standard for kind of town or suburban communities like Scarborough, where um, multifamily housing developers are looking for buildings that size. They're not looking to do like large apartment buildings and the town may not be, you know, wanting large apartment buildings that you might see in Portland. So this size kind of works for the industry. It also could work well for fitting into an area like Haggis Parkway. Um, in terms of number of units per building, I mean that the industry um, and developers in general might be looking at 22, 24, 26 units per building if it's about that size and three stories. Um, just to give you a sense for that, they could be more, it could be less, but that's about the range of the number of units per building that's, that's likely if the maximum footprint is kind of reached and the height is reached. Um, what's not being amended that needs to be keep, kept in mind, it's, it's not proposing to change the overall density um, that's allowed on a property. So this isn't changing the density from <coughs> five units per acre to ten or something higher. It's really just regulating the size of buildings and how they're arranged on properties. Um, since your first reading, the planning board had a public hearing and there was 
unanimous support for the amendments from the planning board. So they recommended, um, they provided a positive recommendation to you on the proposed changes. And um, also since your first reading, we looked at a few questions the council kind of brought up in regards to, to building height um, and whether the town should be looking at allowing residential to be the same height as commercial in this zone, you know, six stories rather than this three stories. Um, and looking at it internally, staff at this point recommends that three stories probably makes sense as a first step. It's really what um, developers are looking at for suburban communities like Scarborough. Um, and when you allow only five units per acre overall on a project, you're very, it's very unlikely that that's enough overall density to produce taller buildings, you know, to, to, to see four or five, six story apartment buildings because overall the density wouldn't really allow that many units in a building. Um, so, and I guess lastly, really the kind of the construction style changes a lot when you go to four or five, six stories. Um, it's a different, there's often elevators, there's, um, it's, it's really a different kind of softened steel framing versus uh, wood framing. So it's, it's a different kind of, the economics are different, I think, for developers. Um, so I don't think we're likely to see a lot of proposals for, even if we allowed it, for, you know, real tall residential um, style apartments that you might see, say, in Portland. Um, and I guess lastly, the other question was what about a mixed-use building? Say there's commercial and residential in the same building. And um, you'll see in your packages there's a very modest amendment that's been offered for your consideration that, that would allow non-residential, so commercial and mixed-use buildings to still abide by the six-story uh, height limit. Because Hygus Parkway is a commercial zone, we want to see commercial development occur. So if there's a proposal that comes forward with, you know, say half and half, half commercial, half residential, and the residential helps <coughs> make that make that work, then it seems like it, it makes sense to um, allow that those to be taller um, and consistent with the commercial standards. And so that will necessitate uh, an amendment to the second reading? It will. In your packets, there's the provided a revised version. It's dated September 1st. August 3rd is the first reading version. Mm -hmm. And then at, at the top, it says revised September 1st. Mm -hmm. And at the bottom, um, under uh, maximum building coverage, lot coverage, and building height, there's a yellow highlighted two words and mixed. That's the that's the potential amendment that would enable mixed buildings, so commercial and residential together, to um, continue to comply with or be you know limited to that six story 75 feet. So, so the amendment to allow for uh, a mixed use building uh, would necessitate an amendment to add the words quote, and mixed. Correct. Okay. Correct. Thank you. And I'm here for questions. Questions of Dan. Chris. So first of all, uh, welcome back. Um, Karen did a great job in your absence, so maybe you guys can work on some kind of job share and she can take the next month or two off and you could shift over to SEDCO <laughs> for a little bit. Uh, um, I do, or at least more than, yeah, <laughs> more than one, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I just want to be clear, we're talking specifically about the Hagus Parkway. Um, was, were these changes initiated or driven by a particular project or a particular developer, or is this kind of a general overall approach to try and induce some kind of development? I think it's both. I mean, there is a few projects that are interested in doing multifamily housing on Hygis Parkway. And like we talked about earlier, multifamily housing is already allowed. Um, so yes, it is necessitated or, or brought to you because of the current interest in doing multifamily housing. Um, but it's also very aligned with the changes that you've been looking at in other areas to mm -hmm to really look at multifamily housing regulations differently rather than unit count, really look at them from a, how does it fit into the area to make sure the size of the buildings fits in with the other buildings in, in the vicinity. So I, I'd, say, I'd say it's both. It's coming to you for both reasons. And follow if I could. Yes. Um, the, so uh, what we did at Higgins Beach with the, um, and I, I, the word always escapes me, more of a descriptive type of zoning. 
-hmm. Does that also apply here as well, or is it still kind of the traditional zoning where it's it's simply just numbers and we're not giving examples of styles and types and things like that, correct? It's more of a traditional zoning. Um, okay. The town for decades now has design standards when you do a commercial building or a multifamily building, so those would apply, but it's not nearly as prescriptive and you know um, specific as the Higgins Beach. So we're not getting into that specific of kind of a character mm -hmm. zoning like we did at Higgins, um, but this is kind of heading in the direction of building size and scale more than the using the unit count as a way to kind of regulate building building style. Thank you. Other questions for Dan? Will. <coughs> um, so just for clarification, this is just for the HP zone? Correct. Um, can could you, without putting you on the spot, could you just talk about what the boundaries of that zone are? Is it sure. just the lots of adjoining Higus? Um, plus <coughs> Enterprise Business Park. So um, the HP district, and I apologize for not having a map for this evening so you, you and folks from home can see, um, but generalizing the, the Higus Parkway zone includes the properties on both sides of um, the Higus Parkway from basically um, the intersection of Scott Hill Road and Higus Parkway. So just up from Route 1 on Higus Parkway, <coughs> zone begins and then goes up to the intersection with Payne Road, and then it, the zone includes land area, I would say, you know, five, 800 feet wide in both directions uh, off of Higgis Parkway, maybe more, that's, that's a guess. Um, and then it includes the Enterprise Business Park, which is off of Route 1, but actually butts up to a lot of the other land on Higgis Parkway. Contiguous, but not by it's road. Contiguous, but not, it's not on, obviously, the Higgis Parkway. Right. But it doesn't, it doesn't include the um, town center kind of? It doesn't include Scarborough Downs. That has its own zone. And then um, to the north, uh, up by exit 42, Cabela's and um, Ginn Road, that area on the other side of Payne Road is a business zone. At one time, it was in the Higgis Parkway zone. Um, and then to the I'll call it the West, um, is a residential zone up on Scott Hill Road, and um, that, that becomes a residential area. Got it. Um, can I follow up? Yes. Um, so you, I, I think I thought I heard you mention something about the density restrictions. Could you, could you just reiterate what that is? Did I hear you yeah. say five units per acre? Yeah, in this zone, um, the overall density is allowed to be up to five units per acre. Um, so that basically means, you know, if you have a, uh, a 10 acre property, then overall 50 units are allowed for on that property. Um, the town treats larger units different than smaller units. So um, to enable and incentivize one bedroom, say apartments versus, you know, four bedroom homes, um, a one-bedroom apartment or multifamily dwelling in some zones are considered half a unit because they're occupied by generally half the occupants. Um, so that needs to be remembered. So, but but yeah, that overall it's five units per acre. So that also limits, obviously, the number of multifamily buildings that can happen. Other questions? Of Thank you. Dan. Thank you, Dan. Sure. Uh, we have a public hearing now scheduled on this matter. Anyone wishing to address this from the public should approach the podium. Close the public hearing. I'll accept the motion. Move approval. Second. And I will accept a motion to amend. Oh. oh. Yes, I'd like to amend to uh, include the term. I lost it. <laughs> uh, and mixed uh, uh, after between non-residential and uses. Second. Uh, discussion on the motion to amend. All in favor? Opposed? It's unanimous. Uh, we now have before us the main motion as amended. Oh, Thanks. Um, I just wanted for the uh, for the record uh, just to reiterate that this has gone through the planning board's review, um, and uh, we did receive a favorable favorable opinion. So um, I fully support based upon that review. Mm -hmm. 
discussion on the motion. You see none. I think the, the sense of the body is that uh, this makes sense, allows for greater flexibility. Uh, and all in favor? <coughs> Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. <coughs> Order number 16 uh, 51, 7 p.m. public hearing and second reading on the proposed amendments to Chapter 302, the Scarborough Town Council Rules, Policies, and Procedures Manual. By way of introduction, is this? This is the matter that was taken up by the Rules and Policies Committee, uh, passed unanimously. I know Councilor Babeline was the chief architect of much of these changes and I think uh, was kind enough to put together a bit of a matrix that you reviewed last meeting. I'm not sure if it's required to go back through all of that uh, material, but... Uh, John, what's your pleasure uh, uh, on this? You've been the architect of this and you and uh, I didn't Peter see, I didn't see the members of the committee that organized the effort. Um, oh, sorry. I just wanted to check something. Um, I would, uh, my pleasure is to move approval. Fair enough. I looked at the chair of the rules committee. Peter, your sense is to move? Move for proof, yes, certainly. Yeah. Uh, second. So that's in a form of a formal motion to move approval? Yes. Second. Um, further discussion? I, uh, yes, uh, uh, no, actually, I'm going to wait. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I apologize. Uh, yeah. We need to uh, interject. This is subject to a public hearing. That's Anyone wishing to address? the uh, motion. Uh, motion. Please approach the podium. I, would you like to again make your motion? So moved. Second. <laughs> Discussion. Uh, is this case. the appropriate time to offer yes. a, a second motion or an amendment? Yes, it is. Okay, so uh, I'd like to uh, move that we change some of the wording in section uh, 203.0A, uh, subsection 3 for members of the Finance Committee. Uh, in the second paragraph, I would like to add the following. Uh, the Finance Committee shall meet regularly with its designated counterpart from the Town Department of Education to discuss the appropriation requests and review estimates, excuse me, and revenue estimates from that department in accordance with Article 4 and 5 of the Town Charter. Uh, I've also in introduced uh, the word town in front of the Department of Education throughout the uh, section as well, just for clarity. And that was in the form of a motion, hopefully. Second. Seconded by Councillor Babine. Uh, discussion on the motion to amend. Chris. Uh, yeah, so um, I, first of all, I want to um, thank my fellow councillors for indulging me in this somewhat uh, picky and petty process. Um, I, I know it seems kind of uh, uh, minuscule on some, but I did receive some, some concerns or some questions from members of the school board as well. So um, I thought it was, um, uh, I guess I don't want to say appropriate, but I thought it was a good opportunity to maybe offer some clarifying uh, uh, words around that to make it a little bit more descriptive so that we, our, our intention was clear, which we all knew it was all along, just to kind of clean up the processes and policies, but certainly not um, to try and, and, and do anything to change the articles of charter at all. So uh, it's more of a clarifica clarification process, um, and I hopefully that uh, the intention of what we were doing uh, still is still there and still preserved. I think it's a little bit more descriptive of, of how the process works. So. Other comments on the motion to amend? Seeing none, nope. uh, all in favor? Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. We now have the main motion. Uh, discussion of the main motion. Councilor Beba. I'd like to make an amendment, actually. Um, move approval to amend the main motion to include under section 303.0 uh, a new subsection 303.2 hyphen repeal of prior town council travel policy. The section repeals the town council travel policy adopted by the town council on February 18, 1998 and as amended on April 19, 2000, and replaces it with Chapter 302, the Scarborough Town Council's Rules and Procedures Manual, Section 303, Reimbursement for Professional Development, adopted by the Town Council this evening on September 7, 2016. If seconded, I can explain why 
Second. Uh, it's been moved and seconded to amend a second amendment. I know it was to Councillor Baybine for the next one. I, I'm hoping um, it's kind of self-explanatory for the council, but at least for the public. So Chapter 101 had its own policy regarding town council travel policy that was somewhat archaic, as you uh, read by the dates. Um, that simply based upon the uh, new items of the new language um, is really unnecessary, and this deletes that. Further discussion uh, on uh, this second motion to amend? Seeing none, all in favor? <coughs> Voting on the motion to amend. Unanimous. We now have the main motion as amended twice, <laughs> and I'll recognize Councilor Baybine. I just wanted to thank the Rules and Policy Committee. We did go through several uh, discussion points about this. This is a, a nice opportunity to kind of clean that up. Uh, keep in mind that um, there are other substantive, um, this is more clerical, I would think, um, while there's a little bit of substance. Um, so uh, um, we'll, you know, through the chair, which is uh, Peter, uh, hopefully we'll get to work on the other policies that are in 101 later. But thank you, everyone, for the indulgence. Uh, other comments uh, concerning the motion? Uh, I did, we did have a comment about uh, the addition of authority in the chair to act in an ex officio uh, capacity whenever a standing council committee uh, did not have a full group. <coughs> I see this as an administrative responsibility of the chair. Uh, uh, it's fre frequently people have unavoidable conflicts and it's necessary on short notice for someone to step in. I think the chair, whoever that might be from year to year, assumes that responsibility uh, to be able to allow the public to have the confidence that all uh, of the <coughs> committee assignments are being fulfilled to the greatest extent possible. So I thought that was worthy of a comment. Chris? Yeah, I think I'd also like to point out uh, just more of a reminder that uh, the committees don't set policies or they don't act. Uh, there's no controlling action. If they're recommendations to the council, the council is the one who takes the deciding action. So even if there were any kind of discrepancies, that there's no formal official action taken by committees. They're typically boarded to us for approval or recommendation. So. Yeah, and uh, this occurs only in the absence of the regular committee members. So in most instances, uh, our committees have full attendance, so it's a rare instance that it actually happens. But when it does, it often requires prompt action for someone to show up, and I think that is a responsibility of the chair to act in that sort of uh, administrative capacity. Sean. So um, as the uh, drafter of that, I think that a uh, couple of points. First is um, I think uh, Councilor Chiazzo's uh, comment is poignant, and that is that the committees do not have the authority to enact any um, legislation or ordinances. It's simply a recommendation. Um, the second is that there are situations where, and it's very, very rare, and this is not directed at any current or past councilors that I've ever worked with, but it's about what ifs. Um, and you want to have the opportunity to move your work forward regardless of those circumstances. Um, and I think that um, looking at at least the, I think I've served with eight chairmen or chairpersons, um, they have always had a sense of respect and a direct obligation to and responsibility to communicate with the chairman um, and the uh, chairpersons. So that doesn't replace that responsibility. So I'm really supportive of this. I think it's a, it's a good move for us overall. Other comments on the the pending motion. Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? Unanimous, thank you. <coughs> now we get to the serious business. <laughs> <laughs> Order number 16-55, 7 p.m. public hearing in action on the new request for a liquor license and a food handler's license from Patrick and Sue O'Reilly, DBA O'Reilly's <laughs> Cure located at 264 U.S. Route 1. Uh, is this matter in order? Yes, so moved. This is a public hearing. Uh, anyone wishing to address the council on this matter, please approach the podium. May I have a motion? So moved. Second. Second. Uh, 
comments. Yeah. <laughs> Chris, I think it's in order for you to comment on this. Uh, ordinarily, I would ask for samples. Probably not appropriate in this case, considering you know uh, we most of us have to drive home afterwards. However, uh, being right across from town hall in the future, I would hope that we would be able to garner some kind of <laughs> secondary meeting location or something. <laughs> there are public meeting laws that need to be respected. Yeah. <laughs> of course, in accordance with those, of course. Further discussion, Councillor? I actually, um, so uh, congratulations to Patrick and Sue. Just a bit of history, um, Patrick actually is a former town councillor and former chairman, and so uh, while he has been thanked many times for his service, uh, Sue should be thanked because it's more of a sacrifice by the family when you do serve in this body, but uh, good luck to them. And I have already bought my, bought my T-shirt, so I'm ready for the <laughs> mug club. <laughs> uh, excuse me, Gatorina. Um, I, yeah, I'm, congratulations to Patrick and Sue also. I'm just really excited to see more development of restaurants and um, drinking establishments, entertainment, <laughs> whatever you want to call it, uh, in town, uh, particularly along this Route 1 corridor because I, that's been something that's been <coughs> sorely missing uh, in this town, so the further development is great. Other comments? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed, it's unanimous, thank you. <coughs> Resolution 16-005, act on the request to accept and approve Chapter 466 of the Public Laws of 1975 relating to the Portland Water District. And the town manager will introduce this one. Yes, we were contacted earlier this summer by the Portland Water District. Uh, this really amounts to a bit of a housekeeping matter. Um, Attorney Mueller has been in somewhat involved in this as well and certainly can speak to it if you have concerns. But uh, the town of Scarborough, along with it looks like nearly a dozen other communities, are mm -hmm. part of the Portland Water District um, service area. And for reasons unknown to us and them, um, Scarborough is the only community in that service area that didn't pass a required resolution uh, regarding, um, I guess it's overlapping debt is a, is a way to refer to it. So I really do characterize this as a housekeeping matter. What's in front of you is a resolution that all other communities passed decades ago, frankly. And despite uh, Toadie's exhaustive search of our records, and they're pretty darn accurate, and the uh, water districts as well, we just couldn't come up with it. And nor could we find any public comment that there was any reason that this was not passed. So we think it was just an oversight. Um, I'm not sure, Shauna, do you have anything further to add what, what effect this has? Sure, thank you. My name is Shauna Mueller for the record. I'm a town attorney for financial matters, including municipal bonds. Um, the Portland Water District reached out to me about this um, over the summer, and in their due diligence in preparing a bond issue for their own entity, they realized they did not have a record of Scarborough's uh, passing a resolution that agreed to take the water district's debt as contingent debt or, or a portion thereof related to Scarborough's participation in the water district. So um, it is interesting that, that we cannot find that from the 70s, um, but um, we have always acted as the town of Scarborough as though we were responsible for um, that debt on a contingent basis. Um, so I just wanted to you know, let you know that it's not it's not as though we're giving up something that we thought we had. Um, certainly, this is this is the way that all the other communities have um, have behaved as well. Thank you. Uh, we do not have a public hearing, but uh, I would certainly ask any member of the uh, public present who wish to address this, please feel free to approach the podium. Uh, motion on the resolution. So moved. Second. Okay. Discussion. Oh, sir. Uh, it, yeah, just an observation, I guess. Um, uh, it's interesting our portion is based on valuation, not on population. Is that So it's not necessarily usage, it's just your valuation that counts for your obligation percentage? That's the methodology that they've used since 1975. Yeah, okay. Uh, I, I might suggest a different way of apportioning <laughs> it, but um, I okay. don't think we can unwind that at this point. Yeah. yeah. Other comments? Hmm. Well, I, I would think that that's because uh, um, even if you look at the, uh, and I'm guessing, um, we're, our rating even um, based on valuation versus population, our population is still going to be significantly 
greater than just about every one of those other communities, I would think. So, but it is an interesting fact. Other comments? No further discussion. All in favor? Except for maybe it was. Opposed? Unanimous. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, resolution 16006. Uh, Act on the consideration of an action on inducement resolution of the Town of Scarborough declaring its official intent with respect to issuance of its revenue obligation securities to fund the Martins Point project and authorizing the town to apply to the Finance Authority of Maine for approval of the issuance of revenue obligation securities. Uh, I'll ask the town manager to commence the introduction to this matter. This matter was uh, certainly the subject of your uh, workshop prior to the meeting, but essentially the action item before you tonight uh, is a resolution, as the chair read. Um, as part of that resolution, it authorizes me on behalf of the town, so should you pass this, to sign what's called an inducement resolution, and also uh, authorizes me to submit uh, the application to the Finance Authority of Maine. Um, as was characterized at the workshop, I see this as the first step. Um, I think you heard from Towns Bond Council that uh, the council certainly has another vote and another opportunity to look at a lot of the details. Um, many of those questions came up in the workshop. Um, I guess it, I'll leave it at that. And, and I think we, we did spend the better part for the public uh, who may be uh, tuned in late. We spent the better part of an hour uh, uh, having a full discussion. We have members of the Martins Point uh, organization with us today. We have their counsel, Peter Garcia. Uh, Shauna Mueller is bond counsel for the town. And uh, because this is a rather unique uh, but not binding uh, bond matter on the town, but one in which it cooperates and participates to allow uh, <coughs> Martins Point to benefit from this, as a 501c3, which is a federally recognized uh, uh, not-for-profit uh, corporation. Uh, we're going to take a little bit more time, uh, and I'd ask uh, Shauna if you would give us a brief introduction to this so that uh, while we won't go through the same lengthy process that we did uh, an hour ago, I do think that this is worthy of making sure the public uh, has a sense of uh, what this is about. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Um, uh, again, my name is Shauna Mueller. I am bond counsel for the town. I am here tonight to help you consider this um, proposal from Martins Point to take advantage of um, what's called the Municipal Securities Approval Program that the Finance Authority of Maine um, really administers. Um, this program allows for 501c3 entities to access um, sort of the town of Scarborough's issuer status um, and, and allows um, them access to tax-exempt bond rates for their financing through this program. Um, the way in which this program uh, proceeds is tonight the consideration of the inducement resolution which authorizes entering into an inducement agreement. Those documents allow for, they basically state the intention that the town will move forward with this process but conditions the actual issuance of the bonds on a future bond authorization vote that this council would need to take. What that inducement agreement and resolution allow to move forward is the application to the Finance Authority of Maine, which is really the next step in this process, where they review the project um, to make sure that it fits the statutory requirements of that program. Um, and, and then at that point, um, the council would have a public hearing, followed at some point by a bond authorization vote, and then there will be a bond issue where the town of Scarborough is actually the issuer of the bonds, but will um, hold no legal liability for any of the debt service payments um, or other risks associated with um, the bond issue that will be contractually um, placed on Martin's Point. Um, so that's, in a nutshell, the way in which the program um, runs and, and I'm happy to take questions and I know Martin's Point and the Bond Council for this process will, will be happy to answer. Uh, yeah, so I, I apologize, I, I had to miss the workshop, but 
I just had a couple of questions. What, what is what is the town's exposure here in in this matter? I mean, if if Martin's Point were to go bankrupt and not be able to repay this loan, are we on the hook mm -hmm. for it, or is that you know another underwriter that's financing? Um, the uh, bank in this. Um, transaction has already offered a commitment letter and there is collateral that's um, outlined in that um, document. It's actually a negative pledge on the leasehold interest of, of Martins Point's um, property, but there's really, there is no financial obligation on the part of the town moving forward even in a default situation for these bonds. I, mean, I, th I think the, the public, uh, the confusion arises from the fact that uh, generally when a town bond something, uh, it has an obligation. This is a Maine, state of Maine statutory program that affords nonprofit corporations uh, who are undertaking charitable purposes uh, to, uh, in effect, partner with uh, the town so as to get more favorable uh, interest rates on, on, its, on its bonds. Uh, it's a unique program that is created by statute. Uh, other towns across Maine have used it in a similar fashion. Uh, at the workshop, I think it was concluded that it would be very valuable to have a public hearing uh, two weeks from tonight so as to be able to give the public further time to understand the implications of this for it to be studied and then uh, at the following meeting take up the question of uh, approval, uh, uh, which would be the final approval. Uh, but this is a preliminary approval which is being sought tonight. Mm -hmm. Other comments or questions? Can I just follow well, up to make sure that I understood that correctly? So, so the issue, so KeyBank is the underwriting the loan. We're issuing the bonds. Uh, and this is essentially a, a program through the Finance Authority of Maine by which a 5013C is able to um, take advantage of our uh, favorable borrowing rates. Correct. Yes. And, and, you know, one of the other things that was discussed in the workshop is that the, as an issuer, you have um, certain debt limits under state statute, and this would count towards those debt limits. So there are certain things that, that are affected by, the t um, by this um, bond issue on the town. Um, the town of Scarborough is nowhere near your debt limit, so that's really not an issue. Um, but, um, but those are kind of the things that I'm tasked with making sure that you know, the town is you know, in a position to, to do this without, without putting itself in any risk. Thank you. Uh, Tom, would you speak to the debt limit question? Yes, by statute, uh, there's a 15% debt limit, and that's 15% of state equalized value. In Scarborough's case, that's about $569 million. Uh, we're hovering just below $100 million right now, so the capacity, our debt margin, if you will, is about $470 million. Um, I dare say that uh, I'm no, I know of no project that uh, <laughs> even comes close to that, uh, nor do I expect uh, this or a future council be willing to bond that sort of indebtedness. So I, I think we're very comfortably within that margin. And I think it was left that uh, there uh, we asked the town manager to uh, undertake a number of areas of investigation so as to allow all of us to feel more comfortable with this and to make sure the public uh, uh, is uh, fully aware of what this program represents. Other questions? Sorry, uh, uh, again, I apologize for being the guy who missed the further meeting. Um, but so as I recall, there was a uh, an effect on our bond rating in terms of our in level of indebtedness, and I assume that was one of the questions that came up earlier. It was. Great. Other comments or questions? Councilor oh, Kazan. Um, I think it's germane to the topic, but it's not necessarily on the table now. Uh, there was an issue before about a potential TIF as well. Is that officially off the table? Correct. Okay. Yep. So this would not, this is not including any other additional programming or anything like that? Okay. Thank you. So um, only just for, is purely, is it Key Bank or Andrew Scoggin Bank? Okay. Not that, um, I'm you. a banker, but I don't work for either one. So um, um, what I wanted to uh, suggest before we get too deep into a conversation is that, um, we talked about this at the workshop, is that I would like to put on the table, I'm not sure how to frame this, but 
uh, Councillor Hayes did provide us with a um, disclosure. Thank you. Um, and um, I'd like to word it in the positive sense that I would like to make sure that uh, Councillor Hayes is included and permitted to, to uh, uh, participate in the vote and the discussion because there is no apparent conflict. Uh, Peter, let me recognize you so that you can explain a little bit about that. And I think uh, Sean certainly has summarized our, our sense of a lack of conflict. Yes, I just, just, just in full disclosure, one of the participants from Martin's Point that's here tonight is my nephew, Ben Hayes, who's this young gentleman sitting in the back of the room. I know he's been involved in, in some of the proposals and putting the work together, and so I just wanted to bring that to the attention of everybody that's out there in the council and put that on the table for everybody. Councilor Hayes has indicated that it would have no effect whatsoever on his uh, consideration of this matter, and we appreciate those comments. Any other comments? So, so um, I wanted to recommend that we vote um, to accept that. Um, and the reason for that is that if you recall, there has been other issues in the past that have come forward in which people have tried when it becomes conflicting, if there should be a conflict, um, um, they tried to uh, then impose this, well, there's a conflict of interest that wasn't addressed. And so I think that it provides um, a level of protection for the counselor. I pers I mean, just recall the last session, it was the Higgins Beach issue. Um, conflicts of interest tried to be proposed. Um, I dealt with it when I was a banker for a bank um, when the Higgins Parkway project went through and I just I want to provide Peter that that kind of uh, level of uh, protection so I'd like to move that we um, allow Peter to participate and vote on this issue. Good. On the record. Do I have a second? Second. A further discussion on the matter? All in favor? Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. Uh, extension of course by mm -hmm. Councillor Hayes. Uh, further discussion on the on the motion. So, um, first, I, I want to thank everyone for the uh, the workshop. It was very informative. Um, in the many years that I've been, this is a very unique situation that I've never seen or heard of uh, for our town to participate in. So, I think it's exciting. I think the majority of the questions that I had have been uh, sufficiently answered, at least to begin that inducement process to to go down that path. I'm, I think it's actually very exciting. Um, and might be an example for uh, future projects that come into town um, to uh, be able to use it. There are three things, though, that I would like to have addressed um, either through the manager or um, at some point, and they were brought up at the, at the workshop. The first is that I, I need to better understand the benefit to the town uh, being the conduit in issuing this versus um, the Finance Authority of Maine. We were told in the workshop that the applicant could go directly to the Finance Authority of Maine versus coming through us. Um, and I'm asking for something other than simply um, a relationship issue. Um, and the reason I also ask if there is a, some type of financial gain for the town, whether it's an, you know, a fee for the transaction, uh, whatever that might be, I'm not looking to uh, uh, garner out lots of money, but I think that there needs to be a reason for us to be that conduit um, other than the qualitative value of the project. Um, I also wanted to, um, sorry, I wanted to ask um, about the, what we talked about were the ancillary risks. Um, how is this being reported on our financial statements because it is, um, it's going to be there. Um, as it relates specifically, I think we talked about um, getting the opinion of our bond council, not bond council because we've got that, um, the financial advisor, Joe Contera, if I pronounce that right, yep. um, because Councilor Rowan was accurate. One of the agencies did indicate that the amount of debt and the, and the uh, continuity, not the continuity, the annual debt that we bring on was a focus of attention. It wasn't a concern, but at least a focus of attention. So I'd like to understand any impact, if possible, or at least an opinion around that. Um, and then lastly, um, it's already been addressed. I really wanted to make sure that we have the public hearing. And it sounds like the manager and the, at least the chairman will ensure that. So I really feel that those three things needed to be addressed. Oh, I'm sorry, the last two pieces. So the question I had was, um, does the town need to include in its motion a dollar value for the bond um, in setting a limitation? Because right now it just says the issuance, but we know that it, there is a limitation of $8 million, and should that be in the motion um, for um, approval purposes? That, that number has actually been get downgraded to $6.7 million, hmm. and I suspect it will be further shaped and sized, if you will, such that you'll see a finite number. Uh, when you're asked to authorize the bond. So we'll get a final, okay. Yep, so I just wanted, I didn't know if it needed to be in, in the, um, the second piece is that if you actually look at the uh, resolution in item number six, 
Um, I wanted to actually get a clarification and then I can't get back there quick enough and then ask if I need to make a motion. So item number six in the resolution, um, I can't get there, sorry, I'm not working my iPad fast enough. It references that the payments will be made directly to the town, but yet during our workshop, we discussed that there was some um, absolution in that the payments would not be made to the town, but directly to the um, right. um, bank. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna read, not the whole thing, that's, that's ridiculous, but I'm gonna go, uh, it's the last. Furthermore. Furthermore, the borrower shall be obligated to pay to the town such sums as shall be sufficient to pay the principal premium. And you can go on beyond that. I think I explained it. I, I want to make sure that, that we do not incur any type of management of this program after the fact like we were told or any costs. So I don't know if that needs to be amended at this point or if, if we can, that, how that should be that done. That's in the inducement agreement? That's in the inducement resolution. Okay. The resolution? The resolution Please. itself. So I would take the advice of uh, the town manager on how that should, or, or council. I really think uh, if that's the understanding, it, I think the resolution mm -hmm. ought to be clear in that regard. Would you be able to help formulate the motion that would affect that change? Perhaps you can continue with discussion and we'll yeah. check back with them. I don't think we Let's start by getting the motion on the table and then we'll amend. Oh, so, that's uh, a good point, huh? <laughs> I have, I have, I have a motion. Move approval, please. Second. Second. Good. Discussion, uh, we'll focus on the amendment. So, so I think please. that the uh, amendment um, that you're trying to achieve here is to simply switch the word town out and put in the, the word bondholder um, in the sentence that begins with furthermore in um, item six of the resolution. Can you read that sentence as amended? Yes. That sentence would read as amended, furthermore, the borrower shall be obligated to pay to the bondholder such sums as shall be sufficient to pay the principal premium, if any, and interest on the securities as and when the same shall become due and payable pursuant to the financing documents and agreements that contain such provisions as may be required by law and shall be mutually acceptable to the town and the borrower. I'll uh, accept the motion to amend. So moved in those words. Second. <laughs> Discussion on the motion to amend. Seeing none, voting on the motion to amend. All in favor? Opposed? Unanimous. Uh, we now no. have an amended main no, motion. No. Councilor St. Clair. No, she voted against, against it. it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Six to one. Uh, discussion on the main motion as amended. Any further discussion? Mm. Councilor Katerina. Um, yeah, I, I will go on the record as saying that as long as this so-called this resolution doesn't commit us to anything at this point, I'm willing to let it go forward. But, you know, I'll be honest, I had a lot of questions tonight, too, that, w that were answered adequately, but um, I, I really need more time to really digest. It's not like I got hit between the eyes with this uh, on the agenda, and I was like, what the heck is this? Um, so, th I just want to go on record as saying that. that <coughs> Other comments? More. Uh, Councilor St. Clair. Um, I also, I'm not going to support this tonight. Um, I don't think my not supporting it, I think it'll still pass through. Uh, it'll still be worked on, but I have been bitten too many times by not agreeing with something fully and saying yes just to pass it through so that people can work on it and I just can't do that to myself um, personally anymore. Um, I have too many questions. I think there's too many things that we still haven't gotten figured out. Um, I'd like to see a complete full package ready to go um, that answers fully everyone's questions before um, I give it my full approval. I am fully aware of the fact that um, this will come up for vote again, and it does give us another chance to either yay or nay. 
Um, but at this point, I'm not comfortable passing this. Thank you, other, other comments. Councilor Kazel. Yeah, so uh, I think in principle, I can agree with the process. It sounds um, reasonable. Uh, Martin's point is obviously a, a good business we're trying to attract here, and uh, we want to make a commitment to them as much as they want to make a commitment to us. Anytime we're talking about uh, an $8 million hit to our bond, uh, uh, I don't want to say surplus, but our bond total, val total um, I think warrants some serious discussion. Uh, I know if this were an $8 million municipal bond situation, uh, it would take an awful lot of discussion and an awful lot of justification. So I would hope that we would get a similar type of information. Uh, to me, uh, as I said, I can agree in principle, but the devil's in the details for me. Um, I, I think tonight is... is um, a, a good first step forward to allow that process to continue. Uh, but I think there are a lot of questions out there, certainly from my perspective. Um, it's new to the town. It's something we've never done before. Anytime we're in a situation like that, I think we owe it to ourselves and to our constituents to make sure we fully understand all the ramifications of what we're doing and what kind of precedent we're going to be setting. So I, I will support it tonight, but I will be anxiously looking for as much information and details as we could get before we continue this process. When we have the public hearing in two weeks, it would be my suggestion that we conduct it not just as a public hearing to hear members of the public, but also to hear back from uh, the town manager yeah. uh, on the uh, matters that we've charged him. Uh, council may be able to enlighten us as well on items, and I believe we will have another full discussion mm -hmm. at that point, notwithstanding that there w it will not be in order to take a final vote. Uh, I think it's a novel enough uh, uh, program that we'll want to be able to start that, uh, continue that process of education. Other comments on, on this matter? <coughs> Councilor Hayes. Yeah, I think I'll echo sort of all the uh, other comments from the other council. Councilor Baybon, I, I really appreciate the list, the three or four things that you came up with that are the same things I'd be very interested in really, really want to understand the financial presentation, impact, and downstream consequences. And then the third, then the second or third thing for me then is to also think about if we start this as a precedent, what sort of criteria, what is our thinking about this as an economic development tool down the road, and what's that going to mean for sort of the pot of money though, that we're willing to kind of invest into our community for whatever value we think that's going to return. So I'd like to spend some time thinking about what's the value of these, these future opportunities for us and, and, and put that into a filter against this. So some work in progress, I think. So tentatively support it tonight, but really look forward, as others do, to some of the devil and the details that will, will come out of this. Well, hopefully uh, <coughs> when we hear what the experience of other communities <laughs> has been, yep. it will give us some insight into the value question, which I mm -hmm. think is uh, an important one. Mm -hmm. Could I just ask a question generally of, uh, I guess, the Bond Council? I, I want to make sure it sounds very clear to me that this council at most would consider public hearing at their next meeting on October 4 and not consider final action. Right. I just want to be sure that these documents have not been prepared contemplating that uh, public hearing and final action would both be accomplished on the 4th. I want to make sure there's no kind of landmines that we're missing. Yeah. Our next meeting is, we have another meeting in September, I believe. 21st. Yeah, on the 21st. Their intention was no sooner than October 4th. For the public hearing. Right. Yeah, uh, at the podium. Podium, thank you. That's <coughs> true. Attorney. September, right. right. Attorney Garcia uh, represents. <coughs> <Mike. coughs> mm -hmm. Hopefully, he can uh, clarify that for us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm Peter Garcia from Eaton Peabody, and we've been chosen to be bond counsel for this transaction, uh, which technically, I should say, does not mean direct representation of the parties, but rather responsibility for making sure the documents are done in accordance with law. Uh, that having been said, the expectation, general expectation, uh, when we presented the documents to you was that this would go to final approval on October 5. Is that the right date? Uh, there is some flexibility in that schedule, and I can speak with your manager perhaps tomorrow or the next day, about what's most convenient to accommodate your needs uh, and the expeditious issuance of the bond. But there's no reason that that schedule cannot be varied within limits and still get to the expected closing in December. 
Thank you. Have I answered your questions? <coughs> sure. I'm Thank pleased you. to work with you and yeah. find what dates work for, <coughs> for everyone. Further comments, discussion? Ready to vote? All in favor? Opposed? Six to one. Old business, then at this time, new business order number 16-56, <coughs> first reading and schedule a public hearing and second reading on the proposed new ordinance, chapter 615, the Town of Scarborough Blasting Ordinance. And to introduce this matter, I think we have uh, the chief of our fire department here. Good evening, Chairman Donovan. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, this is one of those things that has been on the back burner for longer than I'd like to admit. <laughs> um, we started a, a draft of this ordinance back some time ago uh, based on some feedback from my peers um, who are having some issues with some blasting contractors in their, de their communities. Um, we started the draft and then honestly we've had very few issues in town and it's just one of those things that kind of collected dust until most recently we did have a couple of complaints uh, coincidentally <laughs> having to do with the Martins Point project when they first started down there. So that resurrected our, our work on the ordinance and we went through a couple of meetings with the ordinance committee and that's the draft that's before you tonight for consideration. The intent isn't to um, necessarily regulate blasting. Uh, there are federal regulations and codes that they need to follow. The intent is to create a permitting process so that we have a little bit of local control so that we know uh, where they're going to be blasting, when they're going to be blasting, and to make sure that the proper notifications to the abutters uh, is being done and to put some teeth behind the ordinance so that if we do have a contractor that's not following the rules that we have some recourse. Happy question to answer any questions? The chief. So I, I apologize, Chief. I didn't I didn't see it in the uh, actual code here. This doesn't address any kind of liability issues or anything like that, does it? In terms of if damage occurs to, let's say, foundations or surrounding abutters or anything like that. This does not just speak to any of that. That okay. is covered by the contract as insurance. So there's no kind of uh, inspection or, or uh, enforcement requirements from our perspective in terms of if we get a complaint from a neighbor that says my house is damaged, that would go through other channels. That wouldn't be something that the fire department would come and look and go, or the town would look and say, yes, there's, here it is, and that kind of stuff. That's correct. The, the okay. town isn't a part of that. There is a provision in the blasting regulations for pre-blast surveys, mm -hmm. and part of the language in the ordinance is to make sure that that happens. That's not a mandatory thing, so as long as the contractor provides the opportunity to provide that survey, um, that's to their benefit and their risk management plan to make sure that they document those things. But there are times when, when folks just don't want to have them in and yep. decline. Other questions of the chief? Oh, well, I didn't have a question. I'm going to let the chair say, um, talk about it, but this is thoroughly vetted. Very, uh, <laughs> very, very, very vetted. So I'll let the chair Further address questions it. Further questions of the chief? Thank you, chief. You're welcome. Uh, any member of the public who wants to address this matter before the town council, please approach the podium. Uh, entertain a motion. So moved. Second. Second. Discussion. We'll start at the end and we'll work our way down. Thank you. Uh, just a quick question. Oh, I'm um, sorry. We have a chair. We have a chair of ordinance. Yeah. We'll start at the <laughs> ordinance chair, and we'll work our way down. Following directions. Jeez, council for you, by. Yeah, as um, the chair of the ordinance committee, this this issue did come to my attention from a, 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 a citizen who was concerned about blasting that was occurring on on Route One. And as the chief indicated, uh, the fire department's been working on this, but it's never risen to the top. So we did have some citizen input that helped us rise to the top finally and be addressed. And as Councillor St. Clair mentioned, uh, we thoroughly vetted this in the ordinance committee. I feel very strongly that the way it's 
written and put together at this point uh, should be passed as written. So that's my comment for tonight. Councilor Rowan. Uh, I'd like to offer an amendment. Uh, I, I'd like to move that <laughs> <laughs> uh, in section six, um, the sentence that reads no blasting is allowed on Saturdays and Sunday or Sundays uh, be amended to read no blasting is allowed on Saturdays, Sundays or holidays. Mm -hmm. Second. That was supposed as, to be in there. Yeah, as discussed in the committee. Uh, is, uh, is holidays a defined term? I'm sorry, um, so uh, town observed holidays. Yeah. Or holidays observed by the town. I'm, I'm, I'm flexible. So it was supposed to be in there. Yeah. It was supposed to be in there, Tom it's has it. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, the motion has been made to amend and it has been seconded. Uh, discussion on the uh, amendment. Do you want to go, Jean Marie? I was just going to say <laughs> thank you very much to my my fellow detail-oriented <laughs> counselor for picking up on that. But you're right; uh, our holidays should be in there. Good. I'm sorry, the I missed that before. No. For the comments on the um, uh, amendment. The, the Saturday, Sunday, and holiday thing was something that we really like, kind of pondered mm -hmm. over. Um, uh, originally, the ordinance was written for only no blasting on Sundays. Um, and it left out holidays and Saturdays and uh, all surrounding towns around us do not have lasting on Saturdays and holidays and we felt really strongly that we owed it to our citizens um, to not only abide by the the rules set around our towns um, but to um, also give them the consideration of giving them that time off so that's why we did it. Other comments on the amendment? Sorry. Ready to vote. All in favor of the motion to amend. Opposed? Unanimous. The amended motion up for discussion. Councilor Rowan and then Councilor Sure. Bader. I did I did have one question. It, also in committee it, um, we heard concern regarding the number of um, time production blast um, it, uh, in here in section six again it's it's limited to uh, 10 per day. Um, and uh, I, I definitely gave some thought to, the, to that. Um, and I, I feel like um, it might be better. Uh, we also heard from a, a person who actually does blasting um, to say that 10 is about the most that they can do in a day. Um, and it, it might be better to allow them to just get it over with. Like if you're gonna ruin, rather than limit it to three and have them come back for four days um, to get all 10 and just get it yeah. get it done as quickly as possible. So that, that's kind of where I, I came out on that, and I wanted to, to say that publicly. Councilor Bayba. Yeah, um, I have three questions um, um, or comments. On, I just want, uh, sorry, I was uh, I wanted to get the reference to the sections, the three pieces first. Under the notification, it only says four days. Um, did the committee discuss whether that should be business days versus regular days? Because if you can provide notification on a Friday, that means that they can technically start blasting on, what, Tuesday? So it seems to me that, um, you know, the gap over a weekend might not be the best um, in the uh, abutters' uh, interest um, because of everyone's schedule. I believe that's state mandated. Is that accurate? I, yeah. I believe that's state mandated. I, correct me if I'm wrong, Chief, but... Beyond that, because it doesn't specify business, I would, uh, I, I believe it is calendar was the intent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it, it isn't referenced in the code. This was just an arbitrary yep. number that we put in, and the intent was that they wouldn't make that notification so far in advance that people would forget about it when the time came. So that was the idea for no more than four days. Because a lot of times what will happen is they'll hire a third party contractor to come in and do the pre-blast survey, so there's communication up front that contract will come in and do their work. It'll take a period of sometimes weeks, and then all of a sudden the blasting date is mm -hmm. sometime later on. Mm -hmm. And what we didn't want was for them to, to use the pre-blast survey mm -hmm. as the notification. We wanted it somewhere closer so that when it was scheduled, when they knew it was going to happen, okay. but no more than four days out so that folks wouldn't forget about it. That <coughs> and then all of a sudden you start getting complaints, geez, we didn't know it was today. Sure. There's no real yeah. rhyme or reason as to the number of no, days. No, that's good. Uh, that, that's kind <coughs> of thank you. Thank you. No, thank you. Um, so yes, as a so follow-up, so my um, 
I guess I'll think think that through. Um, so that's good information. Um, because and the, the, what I'm looking at is that I wouldn't want to see an abutter receive notification on a Friday for it, um, the notification on a Friday that the blasting will start on Tuesday because of the weekend because they may actually only be two based on their schedule. That was kind of how I was looking at it. The second piece is the liability limitations of $2 million. How is that set? Um, is that a state mandate as well? Because I would think that that would be an, the appropriate level would be determined by the scale of a project. Because if you have a smaller scale project, a $2 million, and there's a financial impact um, to, to the, you know, so, uh, Tom, do you know how that's, is that just a town? No, I, I'm not sure where that number came from, but it, is, it does say uh, a limit of not less than two. Right. And I'm not sure if the size of the project matters. It really matters what's damaged. Right. Um, which is pretty hard to I, speculate. I thought the two million came from the speaker that we had. Yeah, well, I thought he spoke about. So that's an industry average, maybe? Yeah. I thought he if spoke about Do you recall that. where that limit came from? I don't specifically recall that that came from the industry, and, and that's something I probably should have mentioned. Part of this process, we did involve members of the yeah. industry. We sent this out to okay. a number of the local contractors, and we did get some feedback back from them, which was very helpful. The $2 million, from my recollection, was a number, once again, that we used that's based on our bid processes. It, it just seems oh, okay. to be a, a right. common limit that we use in a lot of different instances in the course of conducting business. Cool. Yeah, I'm just not aware that it's rooted in statute or uh, I'm not sure no, what I, the source I, of it is. I, I appreciate the Chief's explanation. I'm comfortable with that. That's all I have for questions. Thank you. Other, other. So not to get, again, too much devil detailed here, um, was there any discussion or any thought given to who will conduct the pre-blast surveys, whether it would be a civil engineer or would it be just somebody from the blasting company or what kind of detail that might in, entail or what their qualifications might be? There was discussion on yeah. that um, and again it was the industry uh, expert who came in and talked to us about how they did it. So, so not necessarily. It was discussed. He's a, he, but no requirement for let's say a civil engineer to come in no. and assess the no. foundation or no. anything like that? The person coming in to do it is 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 verified by the state of Maine. He's certified. Anybody right. who comes in to, to do any okay. of this is licensed by the state of Maine. Okay. So we were comfortable, not to speak out of turn. Sorry, Jean Marie. No, that's fine. Right. We were comfortable with right. the expert telling us that anybody that has anything to do with either licensing or surveying an area has already been cleared and licensed by the state of Maine. Okay, that's what I was looking for. Thank you. Other comments or questions? Seeing none, uh, ready to vote on the motion. Oh, can I make a comment? As amended. As amended. I, I just want. Right yeah, I just want to say. I mean, we really went over this. We had two full meetings on this. I would say maybe three plus hours. We spoke about this. We did have an industry expert that came to our first meeting, who was full of valuable information. We had the chief, chief of police, chief of fire <laughs> here both times, and we had residents here from the town who are being affected by the blasting. Um, and so every, I mean, we poured over every single line item in this um, ordinance. It's definitely not something that was piecemealed and, and pushed forward through the council. It's something that we really actually, you know, worked hard on. We worked with the town manager on it. The chair um, put extra time into it. So I feel um, very strongly that this is a, something that should be supported um, and I don't see any red flags in it. I'm really glad. I do want to just say quickly thank you, um, Will, for catching that holiday thing yeah. because that was a big part of what we discussed. So thank you. Thank you, Chair. Other discussion? We're voting on the main motion as amended. All in favor? Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. Order number 1657. First reading and schedule a public hearing and second reading on the pro proposed amendments to Chapter uh, 1301, the General Assistance Ordinance pursuant to Title 22 MRSA Section 4305 Subpart 4. Uh, anyone wishing to uh, address this matter, please come to the podium. 
accept a motion. So moved. Second. Discussion. Council Bayby. Sure. So um, as an overview, as Chair of Finance, uh, to give some perspective, this issue actually has been in committee for two years, um, starting last year, uh, <coughs> in which we wanted uh, to have a discussion around how do we begin to plan for long-term planning. Sorry. Oh, I think, pardon. Mm -hmm. Aren't we on? Am I on the system? Oh, I jumped it. You, you, jumped it. you, you have jumped it. Okay. <laughs> well, excited about finance. Thanks. <laughs> 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 what are you talking about? Councilor Rowan. I have, com I have a comment about the actual motion on hand. Uh, <laughs> 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 uh, <laughs> more, <laughs> more, more of a question. Um, it, I, I read everywhere maximums, but I didn't see anywhere where that it specified like what it was a maximum of. Is this monthly income? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. For qualifying. Mm -hmm. Other other comments, discussion. So the most you can make is right. And and I sorry to Go right my in. follow my follow up is around the food maximum. Or there are we also looking at? I guess I don't understand what the food maximums are. I believe they're maximums. These are what how eligible households could receive up to these oh. amounts. It's, uh, depending on their need and other circumstances, it may be less, but this would be the maximum they could receive. And of course, it varies statewide. Um, the town really has no say or authority whatsoever. The state uh, dictates what these are, and it does require council action every time it's updated. Is it typically updated annually? Could we yeah. Yeah. Do the same? Okay. Thank you. Can I say something quickly? Uh, so uh, we're kind of lumped in with the Portland HMFA. Is it possible or to see Scarborough's numbers, or is that something that's not available? I believe uh, Scarborough and the surrounding, you know, other greater Portland communities are all considered part of the Portland SMSA. Right. For, for these purposes and others, but uh, for this one. So I don't believe there's any breakout for Scarborough. Right. I've never seen I've one. Never seen, I've never seen one. Hold it. Um, I just quickly, to, to Councillor Rowan, um, it's frustrating sometimes because it's like state always trumps town. You know, we joke about that, state trumps town. It doesn't matter what we say or do. And I mean, I think this is another one of those instances where the state trumps it we have to put it into play but there's not a lot of stuff we can do about it we kind of have to just abide by their guidelines and again it frustrates me um you know this is year six for me and i've never seen scarborough broken down i don't know if phil's ever seen mm -hmm. that um, i've never seen scarborough broken out and it would be nice to have those it would be great to have those numbers i think they'd be valuable to us but mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know if we can get them if you're if you're looking for hmfa breakdown this is a federal uh, right. And their statistical area is based on Department of Labor statistics. I used to work for DHS and Department of Labor, so that's how I know. And and what they're doing is that they're looking at the income averages or means and medium within these uh, metropolitan statistical areas and coming up with these formulas and numbers that say as long as you make under this amount of money, then you qualify for X, Y, or Z. So that's why it's not. Right. Now you can, you should be able to get GA numbers huh. for the town, I would think, on that's number right. of people who for sure. are on. Yeah. For but, sure. but as far as where they come up with these numbers, this is both federal and state formula have been used forever. Do you think it's almost oh. beneficial to us that we are lumped in with Portland and oh, yeah. area? Because it's, it's an economic, yeah. Area, you know, this yeah. is. It really intends to um, appreciate the difference in housing costs, yeah. if you will. And uh, food costs. And, and food costs. Everything food is costs. different. And, okay. and when we're lumped in, so to speak, with Portland and the, and the statistical area around Portland, yeah. it, it allows our citizens who are in need yeah. to actually have a higher amount of money be able to be brought okay. in and still get some help because the cost of living right. is so much higher here than it is, say, in the Bangor right. or Lewiston, even. So right. that's why. Okay. That's what it's based Thank on. you. Yeah, Thank no you. Problem. Other discussion? I just want to apologize for jumping ahead because having having known <laughs> having known that this is pretty much state mandated, um, I, I kind of jumped. But I I think it's poignant to point out that I think that. Um, 
while we benefit because of the group that we in, the other communities also benefit from it because um, and we're becoming almost like a secondary service unit to Portland oh, wow. um, as they uh, um, start reaching out and placing more people into our community. Other comments? Could, can I get an, ask another point of clarification? Yeah. Um, so the GA overall maximum, which is Appendix A, mm -hmm. is that inclusive of a, um, you know, a housing subsidy plus the food subsidy, um, or, or what is that exactly? I beg your pardon. I'm, I'm so if, if you look, there's a, there's a Appendix C talks about housing maximums. Mm -hmm. which I believe is the, the most that a person could receive for, yeah. you, you know, or a family could receive for, for their house. And then there's the food maximum. Mm -hmm. um, but if you add them together, mm -hmm. it exceeds the, um, the overall maximum under Appendix A. And I'm just Appe curious what, what Appendix A is. Appendix A is that's the maximum amount of money you can bring in in order to qualify for everything that's in the following appendices. And then those are the maximum amounts that you can receive once you're qualified under Appendix A. I does see. that make sense? That does. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Other comments? Ready to vote? All in favor? Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. Order 1658, uh, <coughs> act on the request to accept a new policy entitled the Town of Scarborough Capital Planning Policy. And I'll recognize Councillor Baybine. <laughs> Got this right now? Uh, I have nothing to say. <laughs> 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 uh, no, but thank you. Uh, and again, my apologies for um, getting ahead of myself. Um, so just as a high-level overview, the Finance Committee, having been chair for the last few years, has um, took this under consideration last year to see um, really to begin preparation for what has been our desire to begin um, a more long-term planning process throughout the town for all of its uh, budgeting and uh, planning including capital um, we've taken into consideration we took one year to kind of test that policy to see how the impact um, would have um, we've had lengthy conversations and so this is uh, now culminated to a recommendation and um, I would recommend, the committee, by the way, was unanimous in recommending approval uh, for this. Um, I think it's important to point out two pieces. One is that it is a policy of the council if it's approved. Um, therefore, um, I hope that the intent going forward, not only for this council, but even future councils, is that we truly want to um, act in good faith in trying to comply with that. But there may be economic situations <coughs> that don't necessarily um, require us to do that because there's some constraints and you know economic cycles force us to sometimes not follow those policies and it should be the discretion of the full council to determine when that is but we need to understand and know that we're that and when there's a purpose in, in not complying with it um, I think that's a, I hope the best generalization without editorializing a personal opinion on this but um, I can answer any questions anybody has regarding it would other uh, uh, finance committee members wish to uh, address this, Chris? I, I just think it's important to point out one of the things that we kind of talked about a lot coming out of finance uh, was communication, the communication yeah. pieces. And I think uh, uh, it's important for us as a finance committee as well as a council to explain um, the capital improvement doesn't mean just bonding. So we're going to try and put a lot more emphasis uh, in future budgets with clearly delineating what's going to bond, what's going to be uh, authorized right then and there, and, and how the funding mechanism is going to be for each one of those. So I, I think that that's not necessarily spelled out here directly per se, but that's certainly one of the learnings I think we'll do moving forward from, from finance. It's yeah. certainly something that we talked about in, in detail. Yeah, um, actually, I, I do want to point out, actually, so um, thank you to Council Chiazzo. There are, se I'm going to read at least, there are seven purpose statements that we've made that I think are very, very important that go along with that whole issue of communication and planning. So the seven purposes that we identified was that we wanted to determine the physical assets that would be renovated and replaced on an annual basis. We would document the decision pr making process, which was a key to the, uh, to really, the, I think, the unanimous uh, acceptance. Uh, we want to demonstrate a commitment to the long-term financial planning objectives and simply get out of this um, action of uh, going year to year and limiting ourselves to that. We want to annually prioritize the physical assets to be included in that plan. 
Um, and then also utilize debt financing only when desirable. So one of our actions that have not necessarily been part of planning, but really w has been left to the manager is what are the sources of the financing uh, for those projects? Because there are really three sources, um, you know, everything from reserve funds, well, there are reserve funds, tax base, tax base and then um, in debt, you know, debt. Um, so it's prioritizing that, identifying the uh, capital planning objectives for staff, and then understand how the operating budget will be impacted downstream as a result of that. So um, it was a very comprehensive approach. Thank you. Other comments? And, Hayes. and I think I'd add too that echo what was just said, but the other thing is to also just trying to bring some sort of consistency and rigor to sort of our financial yep. reporting and other things. I think what we notice over time as council changes and you know management changes have been kind of different ways of doing things, so we're just trying to find ways to kind of put some rigor to the to the process. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And consistency. Other comments? No discussion. Ready to vote? All in favor? Opposed? Was there a motion? No. Oh, there was no Thank motion. Thank you. Accept the motion. Move approval. Second. <laughs> that no, sorry. Second. Thank you. All in favor? Uh, I, I was hoping. I'm sorry, I got confused by the order <laughs> which we were doing. <laughs> I apologize. What is up with I, that I just side of the questions table? about what. Are you guys okay down there? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is a little slower end of the table tonight. <laughs> um, so I was assuming after the motion there would be an opportunity to ask a question. Yes, so I was hoping to, right to ask. Um, thank you. So uh, one of the things that we discussed at one point was having like a, a fund balance uh, policy, and I'm assuming that's not incorporated in this? That's correct. Um, but there is some mention here about um, capital reserves and those would be restricted funds, is that? Uh, what section are you on? I'm in um, on page five reserve funds at the top, right at the top. That is uh, an actual excerpt from the existing debt management policy? that Sorry. provides some relevance and to this policy and that's why it was just uh, listed and put in here. Uh, that policy is kind of separate and standalone, but there's interplay between them all. Gotcha. So the reason that stood out to me was because the um, three months of uh, operations seems like it might exceed our fund balance of um, whatever, I, I believe it was two months, uh, somewhere between 8% and 10%, which is less than two months. If you look um, at the rest of the sentence, I think this is a target, something yeah. to work toward, that we, mm -hmm. over the next 10 years, look to work toward that uh, three months of fund balance. Gotcha. And I think my confusion just came in is that, I mean, is that even a, is that a fund balance? If it's restricted funds, which would be the operating expenses, would that count as a uh, unrestricted fund balance? Uh, or maybe I'm just not understanding. So um, to Councilor Rowan's question, I, I think, so uh, two pieces. One, I think that there has been some um, desire to look at the debt management policy. I think it's actually called debt management and fiscal policy. And this is a uh, conversation within that. Second is that there's a, um, so there is an existing fund balance, but if you look at the existing language within the fund balance, um, that policy is limited um, at directing the unrestricted fund balance and how that is managed. This is a committed fund balance which is unrelated to the fund balance policy that we currently have. So this is a management practice that has been, uh, that has been um, written into the debt management policy that probably should be reviewed as part of the overall fiscal policy. This really uh, articulates what we hope to do. It doesn't exist yet. It's right. more uh, aspirational. Sure. Thank you. And just and the second piece is that while the current fund balance is on uh, primarily or solely on the unrestricted portion, I think that there is some <coughs> desire amongst council members and at least committee members to um, expand that to include um, coverage within this uh, one of these type of definitions. So it'd be not just unrestricted; it would also be the restricted and committed balances as well. So as a matter of fact, that matter is on your agenda for your finance committee next week. So. Yeah. And then the so this is a uh, this is not a uh, this is a policy change, so it does not require two two readings. So if we adopt this, then it's adopted. Yeah, thank you. Other other comments or questions? Seeing none. All in favor? 
Opposed? Unanimous. Unanimous. Uh, Non-action items, none. Standing and special committee reports and liaison reports. Uh, Chris, let's start down with you. Uh, so energy hasn't met since our last meeting, uh, I don't believe. Uh, and um, Board of Education, the last meeting I think was more procedural and some policy review, so nothing, uh, nothing significant to report. Peter. Similarly, it's been kind of slow, so nothing, nothing uh, to update tonight. Good, thank you. We'll be next time we meet, but not tonight. Council St. Clair. Um, appointments committee met tonight. Um, we actually had two items on our agenda, Coastal Waters and Harbor Committee and the Planning Board. Both of those items were tabled until our next meeting um, for a further review of the applicants. That's it. That's it, sorry. Councilor Garino. Nothing. Councilor <laughs> Relic. Uh, so the uh, Scarborough Housing Alliance met and our chair is here tonight. Um, we uh, were short of a quorum, um, but present were uh, Carrie and uh, Rhonda Anderson, um, and we were uh, furthering the, um, the model for the guidance to provide um, to the, uh, excuse me, to the review, the planning, the planning board, board for um, the definition of uh, what we mean by affordable mm -hmm. housing and for specifically in accordance to uh, rental uh, guidelines. They, they, Rhonda and Carrie Anderson, have a um, uh, proposal which is coming up in front of the planning board that we'd like to um, provide that definition for. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the Historical Preservation Implementation Committee uh, met last night. Um, we uh, discussed progress around locating some of the historic boundary markers um, on the different um, uh, borders around town. Um, there. Uh, we also have been, um, I guess, received and we will be receiving an award on September 28th um, from the Greater Portland Landmarks for the 2016 uh, Preservation Awards, specifically for the work around the uh, Danish Village Arch in Memorial Park. Um, I believe invitations are in the mail to uh, interested parties, so hopefully, you should all um, receive one. Hopefully, we'll be able to attend. It's in, it's in Portland on September 28th. Um, and then lastly, there is um, a, um, a number of volunteers that will be um, choosing a uh, cemetery to, um, to do some cleanup, to, to do some restoration on the on cemetery. That's it. Thank you. Mr. Baybun. Thank you. Um, first finance committee meeting um, that will be scheduled for September, 14, uh, September 14th at 6 p.m. Uh, have a, uh, we've pr pretty much set our calendar or agenda for the next uh, four months until the next committee is set. A lot of work ahead of us, so uh, fund balance is one of those key measures or key items, um, as well as a few other um, around um, metrics, uh, which is a big part, so keep your eye on that. Uh, MM, um, kind of an informal piece, um, I, I've been elected to, the, uh, to represent the town, um, actually the district for the MMA Legislative Policy Advisory Committee. Mm -hmm. My first full day um, of meetings is tomorrow. <laughs> Would really love to hear um, um, in an individual email, uh, so it doesn't constitute community, uh, like a, a group talk, um, what you would like to see, maybe the MMA um, community, um, M MMA by the way is Maine Municipal Association, to focus on for its legislative priorities um, in the coming year, um, in biennium in particular. And then um, lastly, I just wanted to mention the Library Trust just completed their strategic process and uh, I hope to get that pretty soon and um, I've asked them to share with the council as a whole as soon as that's finalized and their next meeting is the 15th. Thank you. Uh, town Manager's report. Yes, thank you. Uh, first I want to speak to, uh, we finalized the tax rate. Uh, the final tax rate is $15.92 per thousand. That uh, equates to a 2.78% increase over the over last year. Uh, I would just recall for your benefit that's below your stated target of 3% or below, uh, though it is above one of the preliminary numbers that uh, Matt Sturgis, the tax assessor, put out later in August. And thankfully, uh, upon a further review before we actually sent the tax bills, we identified an error and it was really just he used the wrong commitment number 
in that calculation. The valuation numbers he previously advised you of are accurate and have remained unchanged. He had just used the wrong commitment number. So uh, the good news is we caught it before the bills went out. In fact, those bills should be received as soon as Friday in people's mailboxes. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Um, one of the, I just wanted to, to note, and I'm going to have Matt provide some further context on both the Homestead Exemption and the BETI program, that's the Business Equipment Reimbursement mm -hmm. uh, Program from the state. One of the interesting things with the uh, Homestead Exemption, we as homeowners saw a benefit this year. <laughs> the statewide exemption went from 10000 to $15,000. Uh, the state's reimbursement level uh, is still at 50%. Um, so. Um, that had quite an effect. Um, in fact, that alone um, required raising another $190,000 uh, or five cents of the tax rate just by virtue of that state law change. Mm. Next year, it's scheduled to go to 20000 Again, good news for homeowners. And actually, somewhat good news for us, the reimbursement rate will go from 50% to 62.5%. So we're told, I'll believe it when I see it, that we <laughs> should not see the sort of negative effect that we saw this year. Mm. Uh, but it was uh, rather startling to see that that, that uh, change alone uh, accounted for five cents on the tax rate. Mm -hmm. And then the Betty program, we had really a banner year. Um, Allaire, a company in town that we've been working with and really cultivating, and luckily they're expanding on site and elsewhere in Scarborough, um, um, has made some significant investments in their physical plant um, and qualified like we've never seen before under the Betty program. Again, that's a 50% reimbursement. Uh, to the town. Uh, if they didn't receive this exemption, or, um, then we'd be taxing them at full rate. So there are some interesting dynamics. Um, I, I think both of those programs have a, a very important public purpose, but there's also some practical, uh, the rubber hits the road here, and we see it on our bottom line. Mm -hmm. um, so I have asked Matt Sturgis to put together a more detailed overview of both those programs just so you can start to get some sense of it. A couple other quick things, just housekeeping. Uh, the chair and I think Tody and I will be working over the next couple of meetings with, um, with the presidential election on the doorstep. Um, these chambers will be taken over for the months of October and the first meeting in November. So your next, the, there'll be three meetings where we need to be creative in meeting space. Uh, we do expect record turnout uh, for the early voting and even at the polls. Um, Sorry, this is not the polling station, though, right? Isn't the high school the polling station? It is the polling station yeah, on election day. This is early voting. Okay. And, and okay. Record Just clarify, please. Can we I go just to want to make sure. Again? Yeah. The VA again? Can we meet at the VA? Well, we're, we're looking for alternative yeah. locations. Wentworth School is yeah. one of the options, and so we'll be yeah. reporting out further. But I just wanted to alert Brian council next year. and the public. We, we need a venue that we can actually host the public comfortably paper meetings and ideally be able to broadcast them. So there's some limitations, but we can also be flexible. So as soon as we have details on that, I'll make you aware. Also, I want to just report uh, the town received some pretty hefty insurance dividends. We're part of uh, risk pools for both property casualty and workers' comp. Mm. And combined, we received about uh, almost $29,000 in dividends, uh, really representative of, our, of good experience, frankly. And lastly, I want to mention, uh, maybe remind, but SEDCO's annual meeting is October 4th. This will be the 31st annual meeting. It'll be at 530 at the Black Point Inn. And if you haven't already, you'll be receiving uh, invitations, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. So with that, uh, I'm certainly available for questions. Questions for the town manager? Uh, council member comments. So start down with you, Council Bain. Thank you. Uh, just three items. First, I, I want to welcome everyone back to the Scarborough School community. Um, there's a lot of little bodies out there on street corners and uh, bus stops, and be careful because they jump out of places that you never think of when you're uh, driving. So uh, um, it seems like there's more kids out there t um, this year for some reason. I don't know why it looks like that, but at least in my neighborhood. So just be careful and welcome back. Hope they have a good school year. I wanted to say thank you to Bruce Sculfer and his team uh, for Summerfest. It was absolutely wonderful. Uh, another great, uh, great showing, another great year. Um, and I also wanted to finally also just say uh, today, I believe, was today the dead, today's the deadline. Um, say thank you to everyone who has put their name forward to run for the town council and school board. Uh, making that commitment is an extraordinary uh, feat um, and responsibility, and uh, I hope it's, uh, I think it's going to be a very good year. So uh, good luck to all of them. Thank you. Yep, so uh, two things. One, I think to um, Sean's MMA report, 
Um, I think I have a very original idea, and then I'd like the MMA to advocate for additional uh, school funding because <laughs> uh, we would like to see more. Um, the other thing um, that there's a there's a terrific um, Facebook page for those of you who are on Facebook. Um, it's called um, You Know You're From Scarborough When. Um, I've seen several of you on there, um, but um, at our last meeting there was a uh, part of the workshop. There was a suggestion made that we might uh, be considering changing the uh, name of um, Highgate Parkway. Um, oh. At least, um, and uh, I just wanted to say that while we didn't, I don't think that that was really discussed. It was something in passing around, uh, potentially rebranding the the project there. Mm -hmm. um, there was some. Um, dismay. Yeah. Um, and so I had a little history lesson that I wanted to share. Um, this comes from the Scarborough Historical Society, but courtesy of, you know you're from Scarborough, Win Facebook page. Um, Dr. Philip Higgis and his wife Faith Stone arrived in Scarborough in 1944. Um, for a, a good period of time, he was the only physician in town. His office and home was located in what was then the corner of uh, Route 1 and Scotto Hill Road. Um, he had office hours seven days a week. He made house calls. Um, he uh, worked in the schools, um, and he was affiliated with the Osteopathic Hospital of Portland. Um, and since Dr. Higgis uh, often responded to serious accidents in town, he realized that an ambulance and a better method of serving the victims were needed. Um, in 1951, uh, he asked the newly formed Scarborough Lions Club to finance and outfit an ambulance for the town. Uh, this ambulance was the beginning of the first municipal rescue service in Maine. Um, so amongst his many duties, uh, he was also the official town physician and served the Scarborough schools for 30 years beginning in 1945. Um, conversation with the older residents of town revealed that Dr. Higgis uh, was much loved and a well-respected physician. So. Thank you. <laughs> so don't change the name. Yeah, I heard from a few people about that too. Just, just, just to add, um, I really don't have anything other than uh, since you brought up the election, I'm sure that the town clerks would love to have some help uh, election day. Um, so if you're interested in working at the elections, uh, you get fed really well. I miss that, uh, and you also get paid. Not a lot of money, but it's a little stipend that you get for working. But it's really fun. Um, you get to check people in. Um, you get to uh, help people uh, find where they're supposed to be in line, whatever. There's all sorts of different duties involved with Election Day. Uh, plus, you get to meet a lot of your neighbors. So I encourage anybody with any interest or time, you don't have to work all day. They have different types of shifts. And the polls are open at 7 a.m. and they close at 8 p.m. And then they have an after, they have a setup before and then time after where they count ballots. So please get in touch uh, with the uh, clerk's <coughs> office and uh, sign up to work. That would be very helpful. That's all I have for today. Thank you. Um, Councillor Caterina, we have a council table again. Well, we have a council table again. Oh, that's, you know, that's a good point. I, was, I think that's a great idea. Yeah, I think it's important. Um, and I have to say that it was fun doing that. Um, the people that do work at the election, um, just because we don't, as counselors, we don't get to really work at the elections very often because usually yeah. one of us is running and we can't work when, when we're running, obviously. But you meet the nicest people. Yeah. And the people that work at the election, I mean, some of the stories that I was hearing from some of the women that were working there, they were older women, yeah. um, it was just a, a wonderful thing. And um, I just, I can't say enough good things about the, the people that, volunteer their time to do that and they're just they're I know this is gonna sound but they're adorable and um <laughs> it's like it, it is it's like you it's like probably the first time I've walked out of an election uh, area and been happy. Yeah. Like I was in a good mood because I had such a great time I spent two hours talking to these adorable little ladies that were just like they invited me to their church and you know, I mean, it was great. I was, yeah, it was, it was finally a nice reception. I think having yeah. that council table would be great for those who aren't running. There's a couple of us who are on the ballot. Yeah, the, yeah, it, yeah. Three there's three that can't, but the rest of us can. We can pitch yeah. in and we can figure yeah, out. That would be great. I'll, yeah. work, I'll work with you yeah, on it. Yeah, I'd love okay. to work with you on right. it. Um, and then uh, the other thing I wanted to say was um, I wanted to 
um, thank the council for being patient with me and um, the public for being patient with me. I've been down and out for a while. Um, I have informed the chair that I'm leaving Monday for the Mayo Clinic. Uh, I'll be out there for at least a week. Um, I will have my iPad. I'll be reachable. Um, but um, probably not until later on in the night, but I will try to answer, answer any emails that any of you have. Um, I have my cell phone, and then I will check in with um, Tom in the chair when I get back and um, figure out from there where, um, you know, where I stand and where my, um, the rest of my term stands. So I wanted to thank you all for that, my fellow counselors, for not giving me a hard time and, and for being so supportive. So thank you. Thank you. Councilor Hayes. Yeah, maybe I'll take a little different direction and kind of build on it. It seems to be the night to talk about elections and maybe social media and some other stuff. And <laughs> just wanted to kind of give a pitch back out to the Scarborough Kindness Project. And, and actually, I mean, these elections just kind of a, you know, a plea to people that I, I, I've known people that have lost friendships over some of the political dialogue that's going on. And some of the stuff <laughs> that I'm seeing on Facebook, just really inappropriate. This is a great time to exchange viewpoints, but you know, we made a big inroad this year in our town and trying to be civil and respectful in our conversations. And as we head toward the fall and into the elections, let's continue to do that. There's a lot of stuff happening, but I think it's important for our community to stay civil and respectful and exchange ideas in a, in a good way. Thank you. So I, I would just like to thank Peter for those comments. I think that, that kind of goes, should go without saying in any situation that we're in here in town. I think. Uh, you know, we, we owe it to ourselves to maintain a level of civility for sure, uh, both in chambers and out of chambers. And I personally haven't experienced it and not looking to experience it, but uh, mm -hmm. I think every, any opportunity we get to uh, project that positiveness out, we need to do. So, uh, and I'll also reiterate Councillor Babine's comments about uh, school starting up again. Mm -hmm. um, I, I know everybody's still kind of holding on to summer and, and zipping around, but um, please just take it a little slower. There's a lot more uh, yellow buses on, uh, on mm -hmm. the roads. and slow it down a little bit and uh, consider it maybe practice for when the ice hits the road. So yeah. <laughs> that's all. God, uh, I know a number of people uh, have been reading some of the articles in the uh, newspapers about the result of the uh, tax case, the uh, partial revaluation of some coastal properties and, uh, and it, because the, the main Supreme Court decision, it's uh, a mix of law and complex tax uh, issues uh, there's a lot of confusion. Uh, I just wanted to uh, summarize that the principal issue in the case was whether the town had discriminated in its uh, a partial revaluation of those coastal properties that were reassessed. And the conclusion of the Maine Supreme Court was no, uh, the town had done exactly what it should do and in fact had improved the uh, 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 proper balance that the uh, assessments of the town uh, 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 were uh, required to have. So that was the main issue. There was a side light issue <coughs> that really didn't have any material effect on any of the properties uh, that were taking the appeal, uh, and that was a practice that is statewide uh, <coughs> and, in, and had been endorsed by Maine Revenue Services to whom we all pay our, uh, our tax, our income tax, uh, that allowed for contiguous uh, freestanding lots, but contiguous to the property on, in question that was being taxed, to be taxed as if it were part of the developed property. And that resulted in a lower tax for that, uh, that abutting lot. Uh, the Supreme Court said, no, that was not uh, appropriate. It should be given its full independent value. That increased the tax assessment in the town and has resulted in uh, thus uh, increasing the tax base by about $7 million. Uh, not a lot uh, when you have a $3.7 billion tax base, but it actually caused our tax base to go up. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, will that mean there's any uh, uh, refunds or rebates uh, uh, for the people who appeal, well, it's so small, I think it can't be observed, uh, but uh, uh, that will, I guess, be sorted out by the Board of Assessment Appeals uh, mm -hmm. uh, in the weeks ahead. 
So I wanted uh, everyone to know that uh, uh, so we much. were happy to see the assess assessing department of the town of Scarborough vindicated in the decision. Uh, and this other practice is really just a clarification that actually also has a benefit to the town. Mm -hmm. So with that, I'll ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor. We are adjourned. Thank you. Thanks, Summary. I'll catch you. But